are wanting to give as part of your worship today, you can go to ascentcc.com forward slash giving, and it takes you to a nice secure web page that you can give your gifts and tithings that way. Will you pray with me? And we'll start this morning. Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for being a part of our life. As we come before you this morning, Lord, we just ask that you will help us to put our distractions aside and we can focus on you and the teaching that you have for us today. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will move in our lives today and we can grow and we can become more like you just a little bit more. We praise you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> If you have your Bibles, would you open up with me to chapter 4 of Ephesians, and let's say about verse 26. Now, I know that last week we talked about verse 26 and verse 27, but I think it's so important that I think we need to expand on those two verses just a little bit more. So we're going to have kind of a review of what we talked about last week, and we're going to expand on it, if that's okay. Is that okay? Ira, is that okay? Uh-huh. He couldn't hear his head riddle, but he's, yeah. <laughs> so, verse 26, verse 26 of chapter 4. And I titled this, we've titled the sermon today, How to Be Good and Mad. Good and Mad. Now, I want to explain that title a little bit. It's not telling us how to be better at being mad, but it's telling us how to be good when we are mad. Does that make sense? And I'll bet you all remember that title, Good and Mad. The first time you've been to church and they taught you how to be good and mad. This is for Grayson, so he knows. <laughs> He's been practicing. All right. Verse 26 of Ephesians, it says, In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. When we are talking about anger and it's a human i guess you could say characteristic we all get angry anybody in here never get angry yeah I, i'm glad that nobody raised their hand because everyone in, at one time or another has been angry and i know i have there are times that i am angry and i shouldn't be i know i'll admit it see what it says on the screen yeah, I'll admit it, but there are, there's a difference between sinful anger and righteous anger, and that's kind of where we need to understand, and that's why we are talking about this for a second week in a row, is we need to really concentrate on what the difference is between sinful anger and righteous anger, all right? Anger is a God-created, God-given emotion that he has given human beings, right? And we are made in the image of God. So when we are talking about anger, one of the first things we have to do is, yes, I admit, be angry. I can be angry. But we have to be careful how we handle that anger. God gets angry, and in the Bible, God's wrath is used 197 times. All right, 197 times God is talking about his wrath and his anger, but God handles anger in a righteous way. And he gives us examples of how we are to handle anger and work through that. In Psalm 7, 11, it says God is a righteous judge and a God who feels in indignation, wrath, <laughs> every day. All right. What makes God angry? Sin makes God angry. Sin. When God is angry, it is because of sin. And therefore, in um, Isaiah 13, 13, it says, Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath, rage, or fury of the Lord of hosts. That is pretty angry, right? I mean, he's going to shake the, how, it says, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken 
out of its place. Anger is a natural emotion. Ang there is a place for anger. And another place is in Romans um, 1, 18. So those last two were... were uh, We're Old Testament, and here is the New Testament. For the wrath of God is revealed from the heavens against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Jesus got angry. Jesus got angry when the disciples forbade the children, children's access to him. He got angry. When the disciples has, took the children says, to keep them away from Jesus, Jesus got angry because they were keeping people from coming to him. And the money changers, we talked about this last week, the money changers in the temple, they really made Jesus angry for a few things because they were cheating people out of money. They were doing things that were not right, but they were keeping people from coming and praying and being a part of God's kingdom, right? That made him angry. To the point that he turned over tables. And he was angry with the Pharisees at their lack of compassion. The Pharisees, they were the legalistic rulers, the keepers of the law, and they would put all these restrictions around the law so that people supposedly wouldn't break the law. They were very legalistic, and Jesus was upset about that. So, why anger? Why did God create anger? Why is it a part of us? Here's something to think about. A life incapable of anger may be destitute to the needs, needful energy to reform. Now, let me explain that a little bit. When you are angry, you have this energy. And when you're angry, we see that things need to change. When we are angry, we can use that energy to make those changes, right? When we, are, when we have this righteous anger, we see that things need to change. And that anger is the seed that we use to make things different, like when we are in righteous anger, right? So I'm talking about anger that is against injustice, Anger that is because uh, somebody is talking against God. Or something that is going against God's principles. That's righteous anger, right? We can use that anger to help us to give us the energy to reform, to make those changes, to pursue changes against those the next, the next thing is, number two on your outline, is we need to understand it. We need to understand it. We do not sin. We can be angry, but we, cannot, we do not sin. That's what Paul says, is in your anger, do not sin. Types of anger. Okay, we have this sinful anger. When we get angry for selfish reasons, when we show our anger in inappropriate ways, have you ever... Don't raise your hand. Have you ever <laughs> have you ever showed your anger in an inappropriate way? I think we all have, right? I'll just I'll just imagine all your hands going up. I just <laughs> and when our anger shows contempt or disrespect for others. Yeah, that's a bad one, huh, Grayson? <laughs> Those are sinful angers. But here we have this righteous anger that I've been talking about. This anger that um, when we are concerned about the injustice of others, or when we are concerned about the blatant attack on God, which that happens in our culture today, right? In our society, it has made some big turn, and I can't tell you when it happened, but it seems like our culture is blatantly attacking God even more than they used to. And when our anger causes us to act in appropriate ways. 
So when our culture or somebody is blatantly attacking God and we talk to them and we explain to them who God is and what God has done for us, that's an appropriate way to handle that type of anger. And that anger gives us the energy and possibly even the courage to speak up and talk about that. But we need to make sure we understand the appropriate way to do it. We don't personally attack that person. We talk to that person, right? We don't let um, different insults out of our mouth when we are trying to explain who God is and what God has done for us, right? So that is what we're talking about, is we want to understand it. We want to be able to have this righteous anger so that we can act in an appropriate way. Did you know that there's only one letter difference between danger and anger? So you can be in a danger zone like that when you get angry. There's only one letter's difference between being in danger and being in anger. The next one is we need to deal with it. We don't let the sun go down on our anger. And we talked about this last week, that if you're going to get in an argument with your spouse, you need to do it early in the morning so that you can hold the grudge all day. No, not really. The idea is deal with it. We don't want it. We don't want to push that anger down inside. We don't want to let that anger fester or build. We want to deal with it. We don't want to let the sun go down and not deal and work through the anger that we have. Okay, here's another rhetorical question. Have you ever let some little thing upset you, make you angry, and you push it down? And the next thing you know, something else has upset you, and you push that down, and you don't deal with it. And you, you keep doing that, and then all of a sudden, you have all of this pent-up anger energy inside of you, and what happens? Someday you step on a stick that you didn't like and you totally explode over some little thing. Now, is that appropriate or inappropriate ways of handling your anger? All right, talk to me louder, I'm deaf. Inappropriate. Yes, so when you let these little things build up, things are going to happen and things are going to come out that you really don't want them to come out, right? In a way that you don't want them to, I guess. But when we deal with our anger at the point of, okay, this, this person, this thing made me angry, this situation made me angry, let's deal with that right then and there so that it doesn't build up, so it doesn't fester, so we can deal with it appropriately. So that we don't blow up for some unknown reason to other people, right? Two guidelines. <clears throat> with dealing with anger. Deal with anger in a timely manner. This is what Paul is talking about here when it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger because if you uh, get angry after sundown, what happens? That's, you don't have much time to deal with it, right? What Paul is trying to point out is, and this is throughout the, this is a, a, a teaching throughout the Old Testament, is you want to deal with things in a timely manner, all right? Paul uh, adapts this Old Testament principle to this New Testament concept that he is teaching of don't let the sun go down on your anger. In Deuteronomy 24, 13, and 15, it says, You shall restore him to the privilege, to, to the pledge, as the sun sets, you shall not opp opp oppress the poor, the needy, you shall give him the wages on the same day before the sun sets. For the poor and for he is poor and counts it counts on it. Lest he cr he cries against you, the Lord, to the Lord, and be guilty of sin. I need to make sure those letters are bigger in the back. <laughs> so here is the Old Testament principle. Okay, God is saying. Um, Make sure that you give this person his wages before the sun goes down. Basically, he's saying in a timely manner because people count on that. 
All right? So Paul is taking that Old Testament principle and saying, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it so that it's not pushed down and festers inside your life. The other thing is deal with your anger and don't you bury it. Don't bury it inside. In Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. By it, many are become defiled. When you push that anger down and that bitterness begins to grow, it actually causes physical harm to you as you have this bitterness and this hatred growing. It causes physical issues. It causes heart, it can cause heart disease, it can cause a heart attack, a stroke. It can physically hurt you with all of this bitterness and all this hate that you have in you. So Paul, uh, the author of Hebrews, is saying, don't let that bitterness grow. We are to deal with it and work through it as it happens. Ephesians 4.26 literally says, Do not let the sun go down on the provocation of you. All right? So here's the thing. If you are angry with someone, whose responsibility is it to deal with that anger? Right here. Not well. I don't know how to do that. It is our responsibility to deal with that. It is our responsibility to deal with that in an appropriate way, in a timely manner. It may be our responsibility to forgive that person. Maybe they don't even know what they did. But it is our responsibility to work through that so that that bitterness doesn't grow and cause us to be inappropriate with our anger. And it says, don't let the sun go down or here it says, don't let the sun set on your anger temper, angry temper. It's our responsibility to work through that in a timely manner. Whether it is working through that ourselves and understanding, okay, why am I so angry with this? Or talking through it in an appropriate way with the person that you're angry about. In Romans, if at all possible, so far as it depends on you, Live peace, peaceably with all. So here we are being told that we are to live in peace with all. So when we get angry and we are not at this, have this peaceful and at peace, we're going against this principle, right? We are not living peacefully with all. So when we are talking about anger and we're talking about this righteous anger, when we are acting appropriately, we are still feeling that peace that God gives us. Does that make sense? Am I, am I coming through? All right. The next one is to control it. Give no opportunity to the devil. When we get angry and we are not acting appropriately, what is happening? We're letting the devil control our lives and not God. When we get anger, when we get angry with someone and we start feeling this rage in our life, in our hearts, and you know the feeling that I'm talking about, right? How difficult is it to control how we react? How easy is it that we get angry and we fly off the handle, which in on a, if we're honest, that's what the devil wants. He wants to be able to control. He wants to be able to control us. And when we are angry and we are starting to have this rage and lose control, how much easier is it for him to throw fuel on that fire? Right? But if we are going to admit it that we, we are angry and we are going to understand the reason that we are angry and we are going to deal with it right now, we are going to be able to control it in a godly way. And in some translations, it says, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give a devil the opportunity. All right. So this word opportunity means a place, position, space, room, region. Literally, it is give no space to the devil. 
We're going to talk about that word space here in just a minute. Give no space to the devil to get a foothold in your life. Because who's going to make us act inappropriately in our anger? He is going to try and get us to act the, as the most inappropriate way that we can. Because he does not want us to be growing in Jesus Christ. Amen? And that is what our goal is. The NIV says, don't give the devil a foothold. A paraphrase is, don't allow the devil to get a foot in the door. In 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking, to, seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour. And when we are angry and we are not thinking about it correctly and we're not controlling it, what's the devil going to do? He's going to devour us. With every trick, every idea that he has ever had, he is going to try his best to get us to act the most inappropriate way. In Galatians, 5, 22 and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, gentleness. Against such things there is no law. Now, when we're angry, when we get angry, are we filled with joy? Are we filled with love? Are we filled with peace? Are we filled with kindness? Patience? When we're angry... And when we are trying to deal with it, and we are working through it, can we take this fruits of the Spirit here in Galatians and say, okay, I'm angry, but yet, do I have love? I think, to, I think we can use Galatians 5, 23, 22 and 23 as a filter, so to speak, of when we are angry, how do we control our anger? And how do we know that it is a righteous anger? If we use Galatians and the fruits of the Spirit, we can kind of filter our anger through that. And we can see, okay, this is a righteous anger. And I'm going to deal with it appropriately. It just kind of takes us back and going, okay, give me a second to breathe. Maybe you need to count to ten and think about, okay, Am I being loving? Am I being joyful? Maybe, maybe at times, like me, you have to count to more than ten. <laughs> maybe it's a hundred. Maybe it's a thousand. I don't know. But we need to take a step back and think of, okay, how is God going to want me to handle this? And filter it through Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So I talked about this giving space, all right? So, in your notes, it has um, some just some five suggestions to resolving anger. All right? And you can think about it of giving space. So, the first one, S, stop. You just stop. Stop and gather and collect yourself and the facts. How many times have you flown off the handle and you don't know the whole story? And you... you all of a sudden, you hear something or something is done for some reason that you don't understand, and you are angry about it, right? You, all of a sudden, your fuse has just gone off, and you are angry, and you're ready to explode onto somebody. Give some space. Stop. Gather and collect yourself. Think about the fruits of the Spirit. And get the facts. There might be a good reason that something happened that you just don't know about, and it would change your total opinion on the subject, right? James says, know this, beloved, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So we stop, and we kind of back up, and we give some space, and we kind of gather and collect ourselves. Slow to anger, for the wages of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All right? So, slow to speak, slow to anger. 
And a paraphrase by David Platt. David Platt is a pastor in Washington, D.C., and he is one of my favorite broadcasts and, or podcasts and an author. Um, and I got to see him back in March in Texas, and he is such a great guy. His paraphrase is, make sure you are quick to listen, slow to tweet and post, and slow to anger. All right, so that really hits home today. Be slow to putting it on Facebook rants, right? How many rant pages are on Facebook? <laughs> Probably more than I can count. But we are slow to anger, and we are slow to, to uh, expressing that anger. We want to make sure we understand it. We want to be able to uh, control it. We want to, we want to deal with it in an appropriate way. Um, the P, we need to pray. Consider how God would have, would have you respond. When we are, are giving this space between our, the, the anger in our lives and whatever situation it is, we stop and we gather ourselves, we collect ourselves, and we pray. How, God, God, how do you want me to handle this? I want to handle this in a way that is appropriate in your eyes. Because that's really our goal, right? We want to become more like Jesus... And doing that, we have to be able to understand and handle our anger the way Jesus did. Romans 12, uh, 12 18. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Did you catch that? We're not the ones that are supposed to be angry and going out and taking care of all of this. Who is going to take care of that? God is. We can have this righteous anger and we can deal with it in an appropriate way, but we need to remember ultimately that God is the one that is going to take care of it. God is the one that will make the heavens and the earth shake. Remember what we talked about a few minutes ago. Our anger, we want to deal with that. We want to understand it. We want to control it. And we want to deal with it in an appropriate way. Filter it through that fruits of the Spirit. The next one is ask. Ask godly counsel from mature those mature in the faith. And we've talked about this, right? We have talked about maturing in the faith here in Ephesians already. And after we pray and we ask, God, how do you want me to respond? It might be wise to ask other mature Christians or godly people, right? This is what I'm angry about. How do you think God would have me respond? And kind of talk through that. And understanding God's character from the Bible and understanding situations in the Bible you can talk about that and work through that and understand, okay, is this a righteous anger or is this an anger that is being me being selfish, me being me wanting what I want and not a righteous type of anger. And that would be a good way to work through that. Having other Christians around you because we're becoming more like Christ and the big word is Together, together, let's work together and control our anger and make sure that we are becoming more like Jesus each and every day. Here is a practical way that you can control your anger. All right, I've done this. I know that other people have done this. And it is to compose it. Write it down. Get your anger out. Um, I just want to give you a suggestion. Don't write it in an email form. Because how, how easy would that be to send that when you don't want to? I would take it, I would write it in some kind of word processor and just type it out why you were angry, what you want to say, and then print it out and read it to yourself. And I think that it will be eye-opening. When you get that anger out on the page, and you read it back, and then you destroy it. Throw it away. Shred it. And as I have done this in the past, and I've shred it, it is 
it is strange the feeling that I have. It's kind of like this release. It's like a weight that's lifted off of me. So that's just a practical way that you might be able to give space between what makes you angry and how to respond. Endeavor to reconcile. And that really is the goal, is to endeavor to reconcile. Go with the intent of resolving the conflict. Not with getting in that person's face, right? It's, it's kind of a conflict management skill. Is you want to go and you want to reconcile with that person or reconcile with whatever event that, is, that has happened. Rather than kindling that anger, we are seeking forgiveness. Go with the idea of giving forgiveness for whatever has made you angry and kind of work through that and reconcile that. It's kind of an attitude thing. When we are going and we are trying to work through this, we want an attitude of Christ. We want to reconcile this situation. We want to reconcile it in a spiritually mature way. Amen? Is this making sense? Are you understanding what I'm talking about? And I think this is an important thing for us to all understand because we all get to this point at some time in our life. Maybe weekly, maybe daily, maybe hourly. I don't know if it's, I mean, let's work through this together. All right. But we seek to reconcile. An ancient proverb, he who angers you controls you. He who angers you controls you. We don't want other people to control us. We want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Amen? How to be good and mad. We need to, be, we need to guard our anger. We will be angry, but we need to guard what makes us angry. We want to have that righteous anger, not that selfish anger. We need to deal with our anger properly and timely so that we don't sin. We must not give Satan room to work. We don't want to give him that foot in the door. He gets in the door enough as it is. We don't want to give him any other opportunities to get in that door. Amen? So here's our next steps. If possible, as far as it depends on me, I will live peaceably with all. Next step was, I will implement space this week so not to give opportunity to the devil. So giving that space. When we get angry, we need to take a, a, a moment, give space, work through that, and then endeavor to resolve it. The person I need to forgive or seek forgiveness from is... That's a tough one, isn't it? So I encourage you to think about that this week and maybe... You need to sit down with that person in an in a endeavor to reconcile. How many toes I step on today? I know I stepped on mine. And it's hard to walk when you step on your own toes. I'll just tell you that right up front. I want to encourage all of you, as we become more like Jesus together, we are all here for each other. We are all encouraging each other. And when we get angry and we start seeking mature Christian counsel, we all should be able to come around each other and help each other through this process of filtering our anger through the fruits of the Spirit. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, as we wrap up our time together with this teaching, we want to become more like you. We want to be able to control our anger, control our tempers, control our attitudes towards people. And I know, Jesus, we can only do that through you. So I ask that as we go on this week that we can give space between what angers us and the way we respond, that we can see how you would respond. 
and we can become more godly. We can become closer to you. We can become more like you each and every day as we work through this together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to our time of communion today, and we think about this, when Jesus was arrested, and he was brought up on charges that were not true, how did he react? Did he get angry? I think he might have been angry, but I think he, held, he, uh, he responded in an appropriate way, right? He did not fly off the handle. He did not become violent. In fact, he was very much a few words throughout the whole process. He did that because he loves us. He did that to be a sacrifice for us, to bring us forgiveness, to show us who God is. And as we come to this time of communion today, and this little piece of bread represents his body, which was beaten and bruised and hung on that cross. And this little cup of juice represents the blood that was shed that covers us. He did that for us. He did that for you because of his love for you so that we could have a relationship with Jesus. As this next song plays and this video plays, um, as you feel led, please make your way to one of the tables and pick up a cup of juice and think about how Jesus responded to the call of being sacrificed for our sin because of his love. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for what you did on that cross. Thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to die for us. Thank you for rising again and being our Savior and preparing a place for us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>